Hey everybody, welcome to episode 33 of the Serial Chillers podcast. This is your host, Jesse, and thank you all so much for stopping by today. On this episode, we cover serial killer Larry Eiler, and I have two of some of my favorite guests I've ever had in the studio. Casey is returning for his fourth episode, Nate's in for his very first, but we had a lot of fun and there's a lot of laughing in this episode, so if you can't hang, don't hang. This one is intense because Larry Eiler was dark, but... We get into it, we have some fun, we laugh when it's necessary, and thank you guys all so much for listening. So as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of the Serial Chillers Podcast. Hey Casey, this one goes to your anus. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> my prison, my prison pocket? <laughs> your prison pocket, I like that. I mean, I don't like that. It's new to me, though. See you later, dude. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> later. Good night, Casey. All right, fuck it. <clears throat> We're going to get going, dude. All right. Uh, welcome to episode 33 of the Serial Chillers podcast. I am here with two good friends. One guy returning. Casey, how many episodes have you won? That's that's my main question. <coughs> I think I'm one in one. One in one? I thought you've been on three times. Uh, have I been on three times? I don't, know. I don't know. Maybe I... Who knows? History was never my subject. <laughs> At any rate, we've oh, got... Oh, I have been on three times. You're right. Yeah, see? Mars, dude. I told <laughs> two, you. Two and one. <laughs> two and one. Uh, Casey is two and one. So uh, if you guys remember Casey or Bigfoot, depends on how well you know him. Don't fucking piss him off. <laughs> Bitcoin yaoi. Yee! And new to the studio, but not to my heart, my good friend... Nate, Nathaniel Bacon, if you will. Thank you, just all of yes. you. <laughs> yes, it's good to have you guys here. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you letting me push back the time on you, and, uh, you know, uh, thanks for being accommodating to that fact. Life is hectic, you know. Uh, sitting up in his new spot in the sky once more, co-host Greg. How goes it, Greg? As God, it goes well. As God, it goes well. I told you I'll close that shit, and you just decided you were going to challenge it anyway. <laughs> I will close the I lid like on you. I think of myself as that giant Jesus statue in Brazil. <laughs> the, the giant <laughs> Jesus statue. Well, Show Greg, me what you got. Yeah, stick out <laughs> those arms. Like let's, let's see those arms. Spread them out. They are ants, Michael. They are ants. <laughs> he is. Look at him redeeming. All right. Well, <laughs> you, guys, uh, you guys are pretty aware of how the show works, but... Just in case you are not, I'll let you know that each week I sit down with old friends, new friends, good friends, and bad friends to tell them the story of an infamous serial killer. Throughout the show, you guys will chime in on my story, and if you would like, have stories of your own that are true crime, dark, creepy, unsolved, or otherwise mysterious. These guys did not bring stories. That is okay. Lastly, if you guys have questions about questions, make sure to ask questions, because I cannot answer questions about questions if you never ask questions. Are there any questions? Nine. Nine? So there are eight questions today. (laughs) There are eight questions today, including an artistic challenge. Question number one. So welcome to and let's play the Serial Chillers podcast. Question number one. I knew it. In what (laughs) year is your serial killer for today, Larry Eiler, born? That's right, Larry Eiler. A befuddled look falls upon Bigfoot's face when he realizes, oh no, I've never heard of this serial killer. So, uh, the closest to the answer is going to get 250 points and a date with Greg. Ooh. Casey's got 1952, 1947 from Nate. Oddly enough. Born in Crawfordsville, Indiana, the youngest sibling of four, on December 21st, 1952. Nice guess, Casey. Yes. Ooh, nailed it. I didn't get, I didn't put down any bonus points for nailing it, so that's just an extra congratulations for you. I uh, expect Greg, Greg to put out fun. on the first date. Greg, Greg is going to put out, though. I was just oh. going to say Greg's. <laughs> All right, so Casey's jumping out to an early 250 to nothing victory. Let me drink some of this mud he poured me really quick. <laughs> this mud. How dare you, sir? This is Tuscan grain coconut stout. I didn't say it wasn't delicious, just oh. that it was thick and it, let's just say oh. it's viscous. <laughs> Those are just terms like old people use to describe things. <laughs> yeah, you had to pull skin off the top of it before you could drink it. <laughs> right. 
So, again, today's serial killer, Larry Eiler, was born December 21st, 1952, in Crawfordsville, Indiana, the youngest sibling of four. When he has two, his parents are going to divorce. His dad, pretty much abusive through his two years of life. Larry Eiler doesn't live a very uh, very good childhood compared to a lot of what we've seen in episodes past or even you know anything if you've looked into some true crime. It's not the worst uh, childhood that there's ever been, but it de- by no means was good. His mother also uh, divorces his father at two. Uh, she remarries when he's four. She gets divorced when he's five and remarries at seven. She gets divorced once more when he's nine and marries again when he's 12. And the last divorce, he's around 14 years old. So he's seen uh, four stepdads plus his own dad. Uh, And from all stories and accounts, he's pretty much abused by all of these guys. They all just shove him aside and uh, get that. Getting that for shout. Yeah. So he's – and just imagine too like – there's probably some dating. She she probably didn't uh, marry the first dude she or she maybe she did. But at any rate, there's some type of courting, which is taking her away from her, her children. There's probably honeymoon or at least some type of honeymoon phase where I can. I mean, we've all fallen in love here. We've probably put some of our responsibilities and other priorities to the wayside as we sort of were smitten. Uh, you know, that seems to be a. Larry Eiler's mother's dream is to just get away, have someone take care of her, get, get, get ride it out for a couple of years till it starts to get tough, and uh, it's why don't you just start from the top? Just press the reset button. Hey, she had it all figured out. Is she a redhead? Uh, you know, I don't have that information. Is that uh, something <laughs> I should interested have? to know? That I feel like Larry Eiler has red hair. Oh, pale skin, freckles. Oh, he's he's <laughs> nailing down. Like, well, hold that for the artistic challenge, Nate. <laughs> The autistic challenge. The autistic yeah, it, it, challenge. it has been both. Uh, at the age of 10, he was looked at by professionals for all of the issues. He was kind of suffering some anxiety and some kind of – he had very childish behavior at the age of 10. And I know that is a, a child, but uh, he was not quite – living up to the age that he uh, showed on the outside. Uh, the professional said nothing but that he had some separation anxiety, which, you know, having a mother that was constantly gone is not incredibly surprising. That makes sense. Yeah. In 1970, at the age of 18, Eiler drops out of high school during his senior year and earns his GED. At that point, why not just finish his senior year? Or just um, start killing. Yeah, fuck it. Or just start killing. Whoa! <laughs> from 1974 to 1978, he has sporadic enrollment in college throughout these years. <laughs> sporadic enrollment? Yes. That's, yes. that's he, pretty awesome. He is in and out for the next four years. He Van Wilders that shit, and he never finishes with any type of degree. Uh, in August of 1978, at the age of 25, he moves to Terre Haute, Indiana. Question number two. His first major crime will be committed in August of 1978. What will he be arrested for? Is it going to be A, setting a car on fire? B, stabbing a man in the chest? C, sexually assaulting a young man? Or D, <coughs> attempted kidnapping of a young girl? Car on fire, stabbing a man in the chest, sexually assaulting a young man, or attempted kidnapping of a young girl? Mm, say D. D and A both... Are incorrect. I'm sorry, you guys. On August 4th, 1978, Eiler is arrested for stabbing Craig Long. Long was hospitalized but lived. That was my first instinct. And Eiler stabbed a 10-inch butcher's knife into this man's chest. So, yeah. I assume he didn't make it past the ribs. Yeah, he must must not have. (laughs) But so uh, Craig Long is like... Pounding on a on a door, he's like running through this neighborhood out of this forested area that Larry Eiler had taken him into, and he's standing outside like, "You gotta help me!" And covered in blood, and can you imagine a ten inch someone being outside your door and screaming, "I need your help!" and they're just bleeding from the chest. It feels like the start of a horror movie, and I don't, I'm yeah. not sure what I would do. Lock so, the door and <clears throat> go away. Yeah, what do you? Do? <laughs> so, sorry, you're on your own. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we've got 250 to zero. Casey's still holding it down. So he's, he stabbed Craig Long in the chest, the 10-inch uh, butcher's knife. Um, how it got set up was that he met Craig at a club and drove him out to a forested area, handcuffed him, and sexually assaulted him. 
Craig Long was able to get away, but never officially identified Eiler as the person who did this. Um, three months later, November 13th, 1978, Eiler turns himself in and pleads guilty to the aggravated battery, uh, but is only fined $43 because Craig Long never really made much of it. He got stitched up and went home. That's kind of seems to be the deal. I think, you know, we're thinking we're talking 1978. He was kind of caught red handed, so to speak, going out and, you know, doing some shit out in the forest with another guy and got caught Terre, up with the wrong guy. In, Terre Haute, Indiana. In so. Terre Haute, Indiana. I'm <laughs> sure they were very accepting of the homosexual community <clears throat> out there. I don't think that's how they get down. Yeah. Uh, what was that? I think they still are accepting. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe good reason he felt not to push this any further he maybe told his family he got mugged and stabbed and that was the end of it and so eiler does not punish for this crime and this this again is another thing that happens a lot too is they the early crimes they go completely unpunished for and then in their minds they're like i can fucking get away with it i'm god yeah i they think they're greg they're sitting up on a shelf sitting up on a shelf Stabbing people in the goddamn chest, thinking that with 10 inch butcher's knives. Eating marshmallows. Yeah, what the hell? I mean, who are we really talking about here? So, for the whole event, after pleading guilty, and you know, the whole thing is, is he was away and his conscience, I think, got the best of him, which is something mm-hmm. we don't really see in serial killers much either. Three months later, he's like, I, I gotta turn myself in for this, and does, and gets fined $43. What? Is- when was this? Uh, November 13th, 1978. Forty three dollars. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. It's probably like his booking fee, and like they're like, "Well, we, why did you?" It's probably you fucking suck. You don't want to do this paperwork, bro. You, just, you were <laughs> you had gotten away with it, Jesus. So a couple of years later, thirty year old Larry Eiler in October of nineteen eighty two, he strangles Delvoid Baker, a young black male who is fourteen years old. Delvoid's body is found dumped on the side of the road north of Indianapolis. Uh, we're gonna kind of get. Gonna kind of get rolling here, and it's the same kind of situation too, where he gives a little bit of information of where he got the bodies, and he was definitely a stabber. Um, but there's not a whole lot of information as to what went down during most of the killing. So I kind of to cover the basis and not bring any of the false stories. I'm just gonna kind of tell you about the discovery of most of the bodies. Um, so we still account for all of the, the victims, and I, and I'll kind of go. We'll we'll get back to this, but uh, at the time he's gonna get convicted it's for like two killings and there's um, these here kind of account for a list he's going to put out uh, after he dies so a uh, very tupac of him uh, <laughs> so uh, peace. yeah oh will on october 23rd 1982 just two weeks or excuse me three weeks after he strangles delvoid baker uh, Stephen crockett a white male who is 19 is stabbed to death how many times does Larry Eiler stab Stephen <coughs> Crockett? <coughs> the closest to the answer, we'll get 250 points. I normally don't uh, do questions about the murders. This is uh, off color for me, but I'm trying something new out here. How many, how many stabs so, did he get? I am like, like so following along the story. and looking yeah, yeah. at the pictures of the victims uh-huh. as you're doing this. So I'm looking at Stephen, Stephen Crockett right now. The crime scene photo? No, 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 no. Just, oh, a, just oh, a picture of him. Oh, just okay. a picture of what he looks like. He's very... Um... Larry Eiler? Oh, and Owen, Owen Wilson at Crockett, meets... Oh, okay. Uh, I was Keanu at Reeves Eiler. meets Sean Penn. Ah, he's a good-looking fellow, you're saying. Yeah, we know with, just with, with Sean Penn and Bad Boys <laughs> or older Sean Penn? Well, I was thinking more of the Keanu. That was my shit. Um, yeah. Dude. <laughs> okay. That was my number. Uh, I don't know why I can't get rid of that number. So, how many times does Larry Eiler stab? 27? Is that what we've got? What do we got? 127. (laughs) Dude, 27 was in my mind. Throw 100 on top of Casey's answer to 127. Larry Eiler stabbed Stephen Crockett 32 times. Motherfucker, dude. And there are four (laughs) blunt force trauma if he wouldn't have got fucking lazy head. I would have got more points hey it's early it's early I bet it's I early I believe this guy 
It's making that's me look why bad. That he, he he stopped short. He was like, you know what? I could Fuck I could really win some like, a whole bunch of points with this <laughs> right. later on down the road. But you know what? Fuck it. Don't I win a Pez dispenser or some shit? <laughs> Come on, no. anyway. uh, we had we we had prizes. We don't Damn really, it. we don't really do that that's too. Why I came here. <laughs> Broken <Sorry>. Mr. Pooby <laughs> Ball. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> that's mine. <All> right. <laughs> Not even. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, uh, Stephen okay. Crockett is stabbed 32 times, four blunt force wound uh, to the head. Eiler discards his body outside Lowell, Indiana. Uh, on November 4th, 1982, 21 year old Craig Townsend is drugged and beaten by Eiler near Lowell, Indiana. He escapes and flees from the hospital before detectives can complete their investigation of the assault. Kind of a similar situation that had happened five years before. They're out eh, sneaking around doing some stuff that in Lowell, Indiana, probably wasn't, uh, you know. You mean in Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. Oh, man. So November 4th, uh, 1982, this is going to be the same day that Craig Townsend is drugged and beaten. Robert Foley, a white male, is found murdered in a field northwest of Joliet, Illinois. Police have yet to recognize a pattern, even after unknowingly speaking with survivor Craig Townsend. Um, on December 25th, 1982, body of John Johnson, uh, a white male who is 25 years old, is found dumped in a field outside of Belshaw, Indiana. Pieces are starting to come together. They're starting to make a few connections. Things are kind of starting to make sense even though things things are happening in different jurisdictions if you if you see we've been in illinois we've been in indiana we've been all over indiana too i should point out that uh, he's, he's probably fucking running know, out of fields yeah i don't know how well your uh knowledge of indiana geography is but a lot sure. of these places aren't very close to each other he's traveling oh. some distances to uh to to pick up some of these people which brings us to question number four a few of the bodies are being found out on main roadways in fields, the media gives the killer this nickname. Is it A, the highway killer, B, the interstate killer, C, the highway murderer, or D, the freeway slayer? Ooh, I like that. The highway killer, interstate killer, highway murderer, or the freeway slayer? Or E, the red skid mark. <laughs> I say A uh, and B. Okay, so A, the highway killer. B, the interstate killer. Both incorrect. Sorry, bros. He Man. was the highway murderer. So I on the there nose. Was no way. That was so cheesy. I was like, there's no <laughs> way they're gonna pick that. God, I knew it. Was that means I make way better nicknames than the media, <laughs> according to Nate. By the logic Absolutely. you just put forth. Thank I thought you. those were amazing. Thank the Slayer, you. I obviously knew that was your touch, but <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping the media had that going for him then, but I figured not. You just knew that he'd be raining blood. Uh -huh. oh, 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 I see, oh, see what you did there. Yeah, all right, all right. I can see you going into like the newspaper. <laughs> place and being like hey guess what i can do <laughs> <laughs> got any serial killers let me name them i'm mostly interested in where the newspaper place is <laughs> dude if know. you had what do they call it that Factory? on like audio right now to just pull in raining blood for a second <laughs> any work. more than that we'll probably yeah. have to pay for it um, so it was like guitar hero version yeah you know <laughs> On December 28th, 1982, the body of John Roach, a white male who is 21, is discovered near Belleville, and the body of Stephen Agin, a white male who is 23, is found and bound and discarded north of Newport, Indiana. Stephen Agin will be of significance later when we will find that Eiler may not have acted alone. Ooh. Teaser. That's what it's called in the industry, boys. For March 4th, 1983, 31-year-old Larry Eiler <coughs> kills Edgar Underfolker, who is a white male and is 27 years old. Larry is found murdered in Danville, Illinois. March 21st, 1983, 31-year-old... or uh, Larry's still 31 at this point. The body of Jay Reynolds, a 31-year-old white male, was found on the outskirts of Lexington, Kentucky, stabbed to death. So... You know, I, a lot of details I do not have about the murders. What I do know is that we can just take pins and start going like this on the map in the Midwest, and Larry Eiler has killed nearby. That's kind of how it's how it's looking. Um, 
April 8th, 1983, Gustavo Herrera is a Hispanic male and is 28. So this is outside of the MO. Gustavo is the first and only Hispanic male on the list. Uh, he's found he murdered. Skinned. <laughs> he Larry made a mistake. Right. <laughs> Gustavo Herrera is found murdered in Lake Forest, Illinois, in a field. April 15th, 1983. Irvin Dwayne Gibson, a white male who is 16 years old, is found murdered in Lake Forest, Illinois, as well. So one week apart. Uh, they could have been killed on the same day, it says. Fuck, man. This guy needs to take a break. Dude. A rampage. So, and I remember, like I said, a lot of this is going to come from a, a, a confession that he puts out after he dies. So Henry Lee Lucas admitted to over a thousand murders realistically he may have committed like, I think it's like six or seven, <laughs> but you know, it, these are how some of these guys are. They think, well, infamy is the only thing that will, you know, keep me going anymore. So I better just, uh, uh just admit to 7,000. Yeah. Pad the stats. Ricky like Davis, that. pad the stats, bro. <laughs> so, um, May 9th, 1983, Jimmy Roberts is a black male. 18 is found murdered in cook, Illinois. Daniel Scott McNeve, a white male who's 21, is found murdered in Belleville, Indiana. After the connection of the murders, they form a task force known as the Central Indiana Multi-Agency Investigative Team. Some you fucking know, turd came up with that name. Just, I guarantee you. Just to make it roll off the team or off the... Uh, like that guy that worked at the department was a fucking turd. <laughs> it, <laughs> he came up with it and he was like, hey guys, I got a name for this task force. It's CMH. Central... Fuck, yeah, he came up with that acronym. Central Indiana Multi-Agency Investigative Team. And then people were like <laughs> quizzed on that shit and like if they forgot it, and you fucking you can't, it. You, can't you don't even know the name of our yeah. goddamn task force, Johnson! <laughs> right. You're not taking that seriously. Sorry, it's the C- Central Indiana Multi-Agency D- D- Investigative Team. Investigative team. Wrong. Uh, Take a lap. Take a lap. <laughs> right? I'm done with you today. Fuck that guy, dude. Where is he at? So <laughs> that guy's name. Well, here's the guy put in charge, Lieutenant right. Jerry Campbell See? from right, Indianapolis. We're, we're gonna need to talk to Jerry. That's the deal. Because he let that shit go. He, did, he didn't name it, but he did uh, get assigned to lead the task force, no, assisted no, no, by no, no, Sergeant no, no. Frank Love. What's it from called, the State Jesse? Police. It's not the fucking task force. It's got a name. <laughs> God damn it, <laughs> Lieutenant Jerry Campbell was <laughs> given uh, the lead of the Central Indiana Multi Agency Investigative Team. <laughs> <laughs> Team America Fuck yeah <laughs> So right as they put together The Central Indiana Multi-Agency Investigative Team Thank you uh, Larry Eiler moves to Indianapolis So he's moving into Let's say the heart of the city The heart of the investigation He's going to be a part of it He starts to become a big part of the gay community So he's no longer trying to hide What he's doing And kind of lure these guys away He's just going to go uh, head on, and uh, <laughs> <Freeman>. <laughs> <laughs> and he is, dude. I bet he volunteered for that shit. <laughs> Listen, we you need guys don't have to go to... deep into the gay community. You don't have to pay me for uh, this. You don't have to pay me for this. I guy. got this. Listen, this is going to be real hard. The <laughs> going to be stiff. Uh, this is all for the just job. Squeeze like, in. All right. Well, hopefully the rest of the people give us three stars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they'll be so kind. <laughs> you know, we're trying to find uh, some humor in this situation. Yeah, there's, there's not this a lot. She got really uh, dark really quick. I know. I'm just and trying to break it up a little bit. So. That's what's so funny about it, too, is that like people will post. Like it's not funny, and I'm like, I'm not laughing that that guy got his fucking no, face stabbed off. Not I have to laugh so I don't cry. All right, yeah, yeah. Now you gotta I, switch it up, right? Yeah. Like that's how I, we I spend through. 16 hours putting together the show, <laughs> yeah. and then I spend two hours sitting here just talking about it, yeah. talking about the hours I spend doing this. Yeah, yeah. I gotta laugh sometimes, and I drink a few of those, and yeah, uh, you up. know, break it up. Yes, yeah, say thank you, Nate. Uh, yeah. Give me a five star review to balance that three. <laughs> we will. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate like you. That serious, Appreciate you. It sucks. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. This is the world is <laughs> fucked. <everybody. laughs> but anyways, if you've got the Central Indiana <laughs> the, the, multi agency <laughs> task force on the fucking that, job, that you've was, got no concern. That was pretty good. That was pretty the Central Indiana multi agency investigative team. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Still can't get. All right, let's move on. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Central Indiana multi agency <laughs> investigative team. <laughs> so uh, he. Inundates himself and becomes a part of the gay community shortly after people become suspicious of his behavior. So he doesn't come in and uh, make a smooth transition. People are like, 
who's this new Larry Eiler guy? I like the I like what he's got going on. They're like, who the fuck is this creep keeps trying to get me to go out to the fucking forest with him alone? And I can see the handcuffs in his back pocket. It's worn into the denim. I see the wear. <laughs> It's like a Copenhagen ring. I yeah. was just going to say that. <laughs> it's my cope. So um, a gay newspaper called The Works set up a hotline and published a profile of the suspected serial killer, whether po- the police wanted to help or not. So this was a big uh, area of argument, too, is that a lot of people were saying, well, like... Nobody was going after it. Because so they're killing, like, happening. you know, both gay men and gay sex-working men. So we're just going to let it slide. And a lot of, you know, we've had a few episodes, too, where we talk about how the police are like, look, we're not going to go and spend all this time trying to find the killers of sex-working women. Right. We're talking about late 70s, early 80s, Indiana sex-working homosexual men. Yeah, nobody, these, nobody's yeah, these, looking. This is, yeah. This is pre-Mike Pence. Yeah, this is... This is <laughs> you can't just electrocute the gay away. <laughs> Mike Pence. You hear, heard that? <laughs> so the the newspapers has got the profile set up, kind of spreading a word throughout the community because that's the community, uh, obviously at this point most affected. Um, yeah, and they're probably fucking freaked out. They're like, they don't want to see one of their friends. I mean, that's somebody's friends, well, right? And, and like you, there. and like you said too, like you're like, what the fuck? How many are we? I'm gonna hear it's just the yeah, list no, just goes insane, on you're just and thinking, on. Man, it's like in the, the same area too. Like this dude's like running out of space to drop people. That and you know? you'll you'll, like at driving around like hmm. Well, no, that one. Yeah. Uh, oh, I've been there before. Actually. Yeah, right. Like what the fuck? I, another thing too is that like a lot of times I'll have a killing and then I'll have like some event that happens and he bought this weird car that's gonna help him get identified. I, I, we just rolled through like eleven murders and there was nothing that was happening in between. Those were spread out by like eight months. No, no, it was not a very the, his entire career is only going to last like I think it's something like five years and it's going to be prolific. So um, on July 2nd, 1983, an unidentified male is found murdered in Ford, Illinois. On August 31st, 1983, Ralph Khaleesi is a white male, a 28 year old who is found uh, bringing Eiler's kill count to 13. Question number six. Uh, I should have, and I totally forgot to give you question number five, which is the artistic challenge. Ooh. So that'll get judged at the end by Greg. Uh, Greg, give me your spiel. Pander to your judge. Pander to your judge. He takes bribes. He's already eaten all Do you the accept food. Bitcoin? He's <laughs> Do you accept Bitcoin? Um, so... I, well... Uh, do your best, Larry Eiler. You use a penny. It'll it'll do. It'll be due at the end. We don't have a crazy, crazy long episode here today, but uh, you know, get your Larry Eiler on. But question number six, which is not the artistic challenge, Larry is responsible for thirteen we've talked about so far. How many is Larry supposedly responsible for? Now I'm going to give you the number that he gives in his confession. 22 to 23 as the as the total number so uh he's killed 13 so far it's august 31st 1983 question number six how many is larry supposedly responsible for 13 so far closest to that number is going to receive 250 points this is total total yeah 22 give me two to 23 can i pick two numbers uh pick one 22.5 <laughs> I feel like if I said 23, I'd be lying. Like, maybe I dipped a ball. Well, the point five is from the stabbing, right? The mm, first stabbing mm, with the... Mm, mm. I'm not counting that, dude. Man, somebody just need to fucking just punch this dude at some point. Yeah. Maybe, the, maybe they twice. have. I don't know. I don't know. All right. <laughs> maybe they have. <laughs> what do you got? Casey says 41. Nate, did you stick with your verbal answer? Yeah, 22.5. Nate says 22.5 and is going to score for the first time Dang. because Larry Eiler, by the time it's all said and done by his account and some that we can prove is going to be responsible for 21 killings. Yeah, man, that was pretty close. Yeah. So we are, uh, we're 13 killings in Nate's, uh, down 250 to 500 artistic challenge is, a. Uh, it could be a swinger this time. It is only for 250 points this time, not the extended 500. So uh, Casey doesn't have some huge advantage. Thank you. So <laughs> Ralph Khaleesi, kind of an important one as well. Ralph is going to be stabbed 17 times. His body was discovered in a field outside of Lake Forest, Illinois, with his pants down around his <laughs> ankles. Oh, man. Now, we have a little bit more information about Ralph Khaleesi than we do about a lot of the other killings. 
Therefore, I'm for the first time going to break one of these down for you and kind of find you uh, give you a little bit of the information on uh, how that night went. So, near midnight on August 30th, 1983, 28-year-old Ralph Khaleesi left his apartment he shared with a girlfriend in the Chicago suburb of Oak Park, Illinois, near Uptown. Khaleesi liked to party and often disappeared overnight, but on this particular night, he never returned from his excursion. A tree-trimming crew found his mutilated corpse on August 31st in Lake Forest near the sites where Gustavo Herrera and Irvin Gibson were murdered in April of 1983. Khaleesi's slang seemed to fit the highway killer's pattern. Mm. Found naked to the waist, his pants pulled down, the victim had been stabbed 17 times with a long-bladed knife and virtually disemboweled. Marks on his wrist suggested that he had been handcuffed prior to his death. Tire tracks and footprints at the scene offered police their first real traces of the killer who had claimed at least a dozen lives. Background investigation on Khaleesi revealed a troubled life. He had dropped out of college in his first semester, compiling a record of arrests for drug possession, arson, and episodes of violence. Police recommended psychiatric treatment, but Khaleesi had no money for counseling, and a stint with the Salvation Army failed to turn his life around. Known to friends and family as a heavy drinker and drug user, Khaleesi was living on welfare when he met his killer in August. Uh, A review of the Illinois cases to date told police that four highway killer victims, Crockett, Johnson, Herrera, and Khaleesi, had lived in or near the uptown neighborhood before they were murdered and dumped in outlying districts. More to the point, Herrera and Khaleesi had once lived only two doors apart on North Kenmore Street. Around the time these revelations broke, on September 3rd, 1983, Illinois detectives also learned for the first time of Indiana's ongoing investigation into four similar cases. The interstate connection grew more plausible when Chicago officers heard about Craig Townsend, taken from the uptown neighborhood of, on October 12, 82, by a man who drove him across state line, drugged and beat him, then dumped his semi-conscious body near Lowell, Indiana. So, uh, he doesn't seemed to kill them all either, which is kind of bizarre to me, but Craig, we knew about. Transported to Crown Point for treatment, Townsend fled the hospital without describing his attacker to police. He was missing in September of 83, but authorities had his mugshot on file, taken after an arrest for drug possession. On September 8th, 1983, investigators from Waukegan and Indianapolis uh, converged on Crown Point, Indiana, for a conference on the highway murders. FBI agents were invited to attend the gathering, providing a uh, psychological profile of the Slayer from the Bureau's Behavioral Science Unit at Quantico, Virginia. The profile described the killer as a macho man who affected military garb and patronized redneck bars in a bid to deny his own sexuality. Mm. Dang, the FBI nailed him or what? (laughs) Man. (laughs) Check. No comment. Yeah, no comment. So, uh, you go so many places with that. The, the, the psychological profile says murder after sex was the ultimate denial. Uh, he, certain corpses he would cover with leaves or loose dirt to negate his final act. Like, if he couldn't see him when he went away, it kind of took it out of his mind. And he, you know, I, I don't have to think about this. So, um, it, that, it was that easy for him, apparently. So, Indiana detectives agreed that the profile seemed to fit Larry Eiler in all respects, from his Marine Corps caps and T-shirts to his drinking and high-speed night drives in his pickup. Informed of Eiler's frequent visits to Chicago, Illinois, police gave their Indiana counterparts photographs of tire tracks and footprints from the Khaleesi murder scene for future comparison against Eiler's pickup and boots. They also agreed to keep watch on Eiler if he surfaced in Chicago. Before the month was over, Indiana State Police would have their chance to stop the highway killer, but the opportunity would find them grossly unprepared. We'll take a quick break right here. Hmm. Uh, Come back, finish up this fucked up story of Larry Eiler. Uh, Make sure you come back, or I'll kill you. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Serial Chillers podcast. If you're back, we don't have to kill you, and that's cool, because we don't want to. Remember, we were talking about Larry Eiler uh, being possibly discovered by the Indiana State Police and then being grossly unprepared to deal with him. On September 30th, 1983, at the age of 31 in Indiana... Oh, the Indiana Highway officer was not 31. Eiler was 31. Uh, An Indian officer sees Eiler's pickup truck parked on the side of Interstate 65. He also sees two men moving towards the woods, with one of them appearing to be bound. 
this motherfucker is at it again. Upon further investigation, the young man accuses Eiler of making homosexual advances and asking if he could tie him up. The police officer searched Eiler's car and found surgical tape, nylon clothesline, and a hunting knife that was stained with human blood. The blood on the knife matched Ralph Khaleesi's. Eiler's tire tracks and boot prints were strikingly similar to the ones in the field where Khaleesi's body was dumped. On October 1st, 83, Eiler moves in with his secret lover, John Dobrovolsky's family and Dobrovolsky's wife and kids. Now, seems confusing. What What's going fuck? on here? Why didn't he go to jail this night? Well, apparently, uh, just a lot of loopholes. He was under 50s. investigation. Like, they didn't have, an, like, enough to hold him for anything quite yet. So he's under investigation and still out kind of doing his thing. Um, what, what were you going to say? 60, $63 fine. Yeah, 40, 43, <laughs> uh, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah blood on yeah, the yeah. knife. Uh, we'll do uh, yeah. 57 this time. You should be good. <laughs> <laughs> you do it at even 60 and yeah. you'll have a credit towards your next crime. Maybe we'll actually try to solve a fucking crime this year. I don't know. So the he's... fucking central <laughs> Indiana multi the investigative God team. <laughs> <laughs> so John Dobrovolsky uh, is... Eiler's secret lover, he moves in as like, you know, hey, I'm just moving in with my buddy John here, but really he and John are uh, sexually involved and uh, he lives there with the man he's having an affair with and that man's family. Hmm. Eiler winning at life apparently. People. People. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Winning. man. laughs> so a couple days after moving in with Dobrovlowski, uh, Derek Hansen is a white male and 18 is found sexually assaulted and dismembered in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So now we've, oh, fuck. we're branching out. Mm-hmm. Like Nate said, he's just running out of goddamn fields. Yeah. He's good. Going to head over to Wisconsin. Man. Don't you know? <laughs> Don't you know? So, He's he's spreading his wings. He's he's the bodies are being spread out farther. I'm not sure if you know it is something similar to he doesn't he doesn't know where to go, so he's just driving until he f- it feels right. If it's well, he's still definitely d- got freaked out by Highway Patrol, right? Yes. Yeah. He's, so I mean, he's, he's what's, punked right. Now. I mean, he had to pay that fucking sixty dollar fine. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's like fucking tapped out. I don't have any more money for these fines. <laughs> right? I got to take it to Wisconsin. Yeah. Maybe maybe I'll go to a state that'll fucking take it seriously. <laughs> this is where he gets caught. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So no, not at all. So two days later, they decide to search Eiler's car again because they do have probable cause at this point, and they find no hard evidence. On October fifteenth of eighty three, a John Doe is discovered near Renesealer, Indiana. Four days later, October nineteenth, four skeletons, including twenty two year old Michael Boer and nineteen year old John Bartlett, are found dumped together, all with their pants down in Newton County. One of the bodies was decapitated, so they found a mass grave, essentially. We're talking about four bodies here. <clears throat> uh, later that month, Eiler's family is overwhelmed with shock when they find out that he's a suspect in these murders and could potentially be a serial killer. Um, right around this time as well, Eiler is arrested and placed in Lake County Jail. Wait, who's surprised and shocked? His family. Who is in... Not the people. Is he still living with this guy? No, this not the, like his actual family. His, his mom, mom his, his dad, his brothers and sisters. They're like, what stepfather. the fuck? Yeah, and okay. his. I believe his mom and dad are both still alive at this time. So they've biological mom and dad. So he's he's got some people going like, ho, oh, oh, I don't huh? think so, man. Huh? <laughs> you think they knew? No, nah, I, mean, at least I had don't an think idea. like they were cared. thinking about that shit. Yeah. Because his mom was, like, banging tons of dudes. Like, that guy doesn't fucking remember. He's just glad he didn't have to fucking take care of him. That uh, may be very well true. Or, you know, maybe it's just one of those situations where they're like, oh, we could probably get famous off this. I think that's now. (laughs) I think back then they didn't have honey boo-boo. So, you know. (laughs) They weren't weren't aware. They weren't weren't looking for that. But, yeah, man, that's uh, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, I agree with you, which probably no. No, they weren't weren't thinking about that. No. So uh, he's that's actually that's that's why you're a good person, Jesse. Yeah, because you thought of that. Whereas <laughs> in reality, they would be like, "That doesn't happen." Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. See, no, I'm a good person. It's true. It's a true story. What are you What are you doing up there, Greg? I was laughing at Greg eating that marshmallow. <laughs> Is he still <laughs> eating marshmallows? <laughs> Holy crap, dude! <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I saw him with that bag, and he said they were stuck together, and that's like the most disappointing thing for me because I like taking them apart. And you can't take them apart when they're stuck together. No, Greg's... They're Greg, literally fused together. Like, Greg's, you have to eat more Greg's than Greg's committed to the cloud. Greg's eating uh, <laughs> to the butter, 
butter, That's why marshmallow, like and an rice crispy. Deconstructed rice crispy <laughs> treats. <laughs> Would you say you're eating it like an apple? Yeah, I would just form it like into like a ball. <laughs> and then eat it like an apple. Apples you shape healthy. it into healthy looking things, and it's better for you. <laughs> You're like, oh. like, I learned that from The Simpsons when Homer made an <laughs> this apple. This is an avocado. <laughs> it sounds so disgusting. <laughs> See, he made an apple out of an onion. Ugh, no, fuck oh. onions. <laughs> onions are delicious. Unless you deep fry them and then give me some, like, I don't know, Moscato? Uh, horseradish or Chipotle <laughs> or something. Or- yeah, all right, no, we've gone off the rails. Sorry. So, no, sorry, no, no, sorry. it's fine. Fuck, I'm hungry. Onion rings, huh? I just had some actually with my French dip. <laughs> God, Bastard. stop talking about food. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> Larry Eiler is arrested and placed in Lake County Jail. So, um, there's the, the the evidence is mounting. They they're like, we, we're let's get this motherfucker in jail and at least slow this down. So at the end of the month, October 29th, a judge refuses to lower Eiler's bond of $1 million. And on November 1st, police raid and search a uh, potential accomplice of him, <clears throat> uh, which is this man. He was a, I believe, a professor at Indiana State University, highly respected. And why don't I have his goddamn name here? Let's put his last name because I'm really fucking professional, you guys. Um Robert. Uh, we're just going to call him Dr. Little. Anyway, so uh, Dr. Little, uh, <clears throat> he is... Uh, <laughs> it's kind of giving away the end a little bit, but <clears throat> he's someone who Eiler is going to say, uh, I worked t- together with someone on some of these, and it's it's Dr. Little, who is this respected professor at Indiana State. So kind of a, a curveball here at the end. Um, police are going to raid Dr. Little's home due to some of the things that Eiler had claimed and some of the evidence that had pointed this way. On December 5th, another John Doe is found near Effingham, Illinois. December 7th, Richard Wayne and one more John Doe are found dead near Indianapolis. By this point, police had enough circumstantial evidence to connect Eiler with 18 murders. In December of 1983, police finally get in contact with surviving victim from one of Eiler's earlier attack, homie Craig Townsend who was beaten assaulted before identifies Eiler from a lineup. So this is fucking huge. This is one of the, one of the two people that have ever survived an attack. <clears throat> They've got that uh, mug shot from the drug arrest of Craig Townsend who they knew had been beaten and taken to the hospital and left without giving a report. They said, look, we think you came in contact with this guy and survived. We need you to come down and we need you to identify this guy. He walks in the room and goes, that's him. Like, you, we're talking, let's see, 83. Yeah, this I is, don't think you forget a yeah, face. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It stabs you in your fucking chest. <laughs> Eyewitness <laughs> testimony is some of the worst testimony that, you can That have, is though. also true. That is, it's also true. Uh, December of 83, yeah, police girl. begin to follow Eiler everywhere. He takes out a lawsuit against them for psychological warfare to get a $500,000 settlement, he says. His attempts fail. What? And instead, he is arrested for the murder of Ralph Khaleesi officially. You mean the cops don't drop chemtrails? What do you know? So he's arrested for the murder of Ralph Khaleesi. Question number seven. Oh, shit. What will be his punishment for Khaleesi's murder? Ah, Is he going to get eight to ten years, ten to twenty-five years, life with the possibility of parole, or will he get off on a technicality? One, one more time, please. Eight to ten, ten to twenty-five, life with possibility of parole or off on a technicality. What uh, what murder is this? This is murder. Uh, Professional. Yeah, I don't have a number for you. I don't have them counting them down like that. <laughs> this number question number. That's you, question number seven. Yes. All right, I say you get off on a technicality. <clears throat> and so does Casey. And you guys are both gonna score points on that. That was definitely the curveball answer, and you that. guys, uh, you Boy, guys bro. got it there. So Casey's got a five hundred point lead. We've got two questions left. Nate, what you need is for Casey to miss the next question, you to get it right, and you need to win the artistic challenge. 
Oh, I've already got the artistic challenge nailed. So that, that's so long in. as nobody in the public views it, I think we'll be we'll be <laughs> safe. The Jaguars also thought they had it nailed. Oh, and terrific time! Ah, sports. All of my <laughs> like all it. of my Florida fans are now very angry at Casey. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. He got he gets off on a technicality, you guys. February first, nineteen eighty four. Eiler is released on bond, awaiting further trials. When the judge throws out the case, ruling the police obtained evidence illegally. Yeah. So they got heavily scrutinized because they were following him around so much. Because he put up the civil suit to try to get the... I, uh, I think that you're almost exactly The money, so right. the judge is, like, super naive to what's going on. I'm like, hey, nobody presented the information the you proper can't way. Just follow him around all day and yeah, so pick I mean, up everything he does. And ultimately, Jesse, what this goes back to is the uh, central... Indiana multi-agency government <laughs> investigative team. Yeah, so this this guy's been on the job for fucking twenty years now. He hasn't solved a goddamn case. He's like, I gotta do this. Yeah, fucking worthless, man. I want to know the guy who finally figures this out because I bet he wanted to punch that guy in the throat this whole time. I think the problem is is that everybody has it figured out. He just keeps getting away with it. People don't talk. People don't say. They That's follow ridiculous. him around. It is insane. It's absolutely ridiculous. But it's why he's not going to stop. So he's out on bond. And remember, all of this is, uh, this case has just been thrown out. So April 7th, 1984, David Block is found. He's a white male, 22 years old. He's found murdered in Lake Forest, Illinois. Daniel Bridges is a 15-year-old boy whose dismembered body was discovered on August 21st, 1984 in a dumpster in the Rogers Park neighborhood on Chicago's far north side. This is kind of the one that's going to finish it up. It's going to kind of put the nail in the coffin for him. So um, Daniel Bridges is one of 12 children from his family. He lived in the same neighborhood as Larry Eiler and knew Larry Eiler. While on his way to meet relatives nearby, Bridges accept a ride from Larry Eiler, but according to the relatives, he never arrived. It was later alleged that Eiler had bound Bridges to a chair and proceeded to beat, rape, and kill him before dismembering his body. Eiler is arrested very soon after the discovery of the body, as he was seen in the area recently. Um, this... He, he this was, guy have a fucking job? Yeah. How does he do for money? He's a. Uh, What's he doing at this point in his life? He's got I, a lot of fucking free time. Yeah, he's just killing, dude. Well, he's living with. Uh, he's living off of government assistance. He's okay. got the rich boyfriend. He's got. He. I think he's just kind of this guy who. So he's still living with this dude this whole time. I believe so. Man. Yeah. So holding it down because I mean we're I mean we're talking a span right now of only. That's true. You were saying it was like months, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. So um, he is going to be arrested for this, finally going to go to trial. Um, The trial is almost two years long, and Eiler is found guilty of murdering Daniel Bridges. What will his punishment for this one be? Is it going to be... This one is just three options. 25 to life, life with no parole, or the death sentence. Okay, says 25 to life. Nate says the death sentence, and on October 3rd, 1986, Judge Urso sentences Eiler to death by lethal injection. So, Nate, you got a, you got a fighting chance. There's still hope. There's still hope. I should have assumed so by where his uh, murders had occurred. Yeah. Well, you based it off the fact that, like, associated him with the gay population, like, they're more inclined to go towards the death penalty. Like, it's kind of like the mindset at this time frame. Like, people are just... Okay, Nate scores yeah. on the final three questions Dang. to tie it up. That means when we get to it at the end here, the artistic challenge is going to make or break somebody's episode today. No. I tried to make it to where it wouldn't. Sorry, Nate. And uh, <laughs> so with the artiste. And here we are. So, again, Judge Urso sentences Eiler to death by lethal injection. Uh, in June of 88, Eiler is on death row at Pontiac Prison awaiting his appeal in the Illinois Supreme Court. On the 21st of November 1990, Eiler was willing to confess and provide more information on unknown murders and even testify against Dr. Little if he was given a fixed sentence of 60 years instead of the death penalty. The state then refused. He was willing to say, just let me out when I'm 97. 
Come it's, on. It's crazy. He's gotten away with so much that he really thinks he can negotiate mm-hmm. this. Like, right. I'll like show you where the bodies are. Come on. But I'll show you. Like, I mean, it's not that bad. It's He's got himself fooled, like, beyond. That's what I was going to say is, like, maybe he really thinks that, that it's not that. Come on. Look, I haven't even gotten in trouble for it yeah. so far. You guys have, like, put me in jail and let me go. Yeah, well, I mean, the fine, like, in the first case yeah. is, like, absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Like, give me a fucking break. $43. If I knew I could go do that to some dickhead that I hated and, like, only get fined $43. I'll you know, pay $430. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. I agree. I agree. Fucking Inflation, bullshit. of course. I agree. It's it, and it, and it is the and case. It's laughable it's, at this point, you know, it, that he's even he's even mentioning that. Like they'd even present that. It's one of those things where I don't ever want to attack police officers and be like, "What the fuck? You're all garbage." But it feels like every time we get into this, we're like, "Dude, just." And and don't get me wrong. There are some times where I'm like, "What a fucking badass that guy is." <laughs> Sadly, in these stories, and I think it's what makes a lot of them so sensational, is that, like, you know, the police don't catch on for eight murders over two years. They're like, it's the same guy doing it, you know? And, and you know, maybe small-town police force, you know, they're not trained for it. They're not looking for the right things, whatever the case may be. Um, if the forensics team can examine and identify each of the bodies based off, like, skeletal remains, and they can't put together that maybe the same guy's killing somebody. Like, they're fucking stupid. (laughs) That's all I'm saying. You hear that? Indiana criminal investigative These guys are all like 90 right now or they're dead, so fuck your agency. Hey, hey, Steve, are you listening to Serial Chillers this week? Right. You know, every week I do, so (laughs) you should too. They're really mean to us this week. (laughs) So the state... Every time I try to call in, I never get in. (laughs) <laughs> it's always Steve So They refused his offer of 60 years In return for some of the bodies On uh, December 8th 1990 Dr. Little's office is raided At Indiana State University He is brought in for questioning But when his lawyer doesn't show up He is let go because police want to avoid Constitutional problems So it's just mm. like uh, his, his lawyer didn't get here It's like Fucking let him go. Let him go. Just, just tell him to go. Like, come, we'll, hey, we'll get it on his dime. Like, so now they've kind of seen some of the issues. They let Eiler go already. They're, they're like, well, f- these guys seem to truly n- not really be sure how to do what they're doing. That seems to be the the long and the short of it. And now I wasn't yeah. there, and I did just enough research to get this show to you, but it truly seems to me that a lot of this was just like uh, at it's least. A bad, it's a bad team. A bad, a bad, like, a were, bad investigative team. I was gonna go you know, to this place again, but I can't remember the correct name. <laughs> I, so I, I can't won't. either, and it's like seven pages. The Mystery up. Mobile. Dang, no, it's not that. No, it's got to be like Central, Central Indiana, Indiana Mystery Mobile, multi agency uh, investigative team, investigative operational selective <laughs> service. <laughs> <laughs> so, version three point two. <laughs> Doctor Little. Uh, he goes on trial for the Steve Agin murder, the one we talked about before, uh, and he's also suspected to have been a part of that, um, the young boy, what was his name? Idiot. Daniel Bridges. So he's suspected a lot of people. I, you know, I was watching one of the documentaries, and the top comment said, like, Dr. Little killed Daniel Bridges. Like, top one, everybody upvoted it, too. And I was, so it... it a lot of people have the opinion that this guy is not an innocent person. So um, take take from it what you will. I definitely wanted to draw attention to his name. His name doesn't appear in every article. He's definitely part of the story, but some people find him less significant to the story and don't think he had as much to do as some people who think that he fucking did a lot of these. So <clears throat> uh, he remains a free man because his lawyer doesn't show up, and they're kind of confused about the constitutional problems. He did go on trial for Steve Agin, and he was found innocent. Uh, He was never officially tried for uh, Daniel's death because uh, Larry Eiler was charged with that death, and they don't seem to have uh, needed to do anything else with that. Sounds very uh, indicative of what we've seen so far. And on March 6th, 1994, at the age of 41, Larry Eiler avoids the death penalty... Because he dies. ...from AIDS. 
Yes, Larry Eiler died from... Well-deserved. Yes, well-deserved. At the time of Eiler's death from AIDS, he was awaiting his execution. He was represented by attorney Kathleen Zellner, who made an appeal disputing the conviction in the Bridges murder. This was pending in the Illinois Supreme Court at the time of his death. The appeal maintained that one of Eiler's trial lawyers, David Shippers, had a conflict of interest as he had received $16,875 from a prosecution witness, Robert David Little. Dr. Little. Little and Eiler had long been associated. Eiler had claimed that Little was one of the uh, men who had killed Bridges. After Eiler's death, Zellner confirmed that she would proceed with filing the appeal to clarify various legal issues. On March 8th of 1994, Zellner holds a news conference to announce that Eiler signed a written confession that he killed 21 people. So that's kind of what I was talking about at the beginning. You know, initially we we're talking, he'd been charged with one murder. And he's got this huge list, which has been backed up. There are a lot of bodies found. They haven't exactly connected to him. So um, the confession could not be released until after Eiler's death. So we're finally at that point where Zellner decided to release that. She also wrote a book called Freed to Kill in 1990, which explored Eiler's potential connection to multiple murders and missing young men in Indiana and Illinois, resulting in investigations being reopened in several jurisdictions. A Zellner uh, revealed the names of 17 males whom Eiler had confessed to murdering and four who he said were murdered by an unidentified accomplice. That person we now know was Robert David Little. According to Zellner, Eiler had made the list of victims around three years before his death in order to obtain that plea bargain of 60 years, uh, which was denied. Later, Eiler allowed his lawyer to release the list, but only after his death. So, Dude, what's up with this Zellner bitch, though? <clears throat> yeah, for real. Just, I just, feel like she's trying to clear up her conscience by doing all these things after the fact, like she's going to make peace with the victim's families and friends and stuff like that. Yeah. Fuck that bitch. I don't know that... I think that... <laughs> I that's think all that, I have to say about that. That's, that's all I got to say about that. I, criminal defense attorneys, I think, are a different kind, you know? It's... Um, that's their job, though. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I you have to defend. Yeah, but you have to have some. Fucking they have morals to have someone to life. defend. Otherwise, them. if you're willing to defend anybody, like, bro, go this fuck is yourself. a capitalist society. There's no such morals in this. <laughs> there actually is, because if you see a case and like somebody passed on that shit because they were like, I can't defend this guy. I'm not even gonna waste my fucking time. That's like energy out of your life. But if you're, you're a public defendant, you, you know, still get fucking... you still get paid. That's true. Zellner was not a public fuck defender, money. though. Like, uh, that's in true. that instance, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that'd be interesting case. Like, what case? What what point would it get to where just every criminal defense attorney is just like, nah, just pass. pass I mean, pass. fuck. Yeah. OJ, they were like, we got you, bro. Don't even trip, bro. You cut her head off. Look, I know. Defense. I know. Just chill. look how small like- that glove looks. Just do this with your hand when you try to put it on, and we'll be good. So uh, that we'll that's a little rhyme. It'll all be good. <laughs> the the does don't not live fit. on indoor. You must stick with it. <laughs> what? So um, that's pretty much it with Larry Eiler. Um, he's dead. We don't have much more about him. He didn't get executed. It's about fucking time. 1994. I f- I, he probably would have been executed by now. We're still talking about some years where they were still killing people. Yeah. Nowadays, a, a death sentence might not as well just save life. Not in California. Yeah, yeah. That's not, what we based that off of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. True, true. Um, so that's pretty much it. We're at a tie game right now. So before we call it here, um, let me get in my position. Let me get those those cards from you guys. Bring that Jeez, with that you. Really take note of the detail in my um, <laughs> art. Oh, Craig. Okay, Greg. Okay, prerequisites. There's our, things our, going uh, on in the sides of our the Our first drawing, I'll give you a little description before I put it up there. It looks okay. like we've uh, we've got uh, a man in front of it. Looks like maybe some type of stadium or building, uh, with a sign that says "Thunder Down Under, All Male, 20 to 25 Years." It seems to be right. some uh, gentleman uh, making some, something happen over on the side here. So here's drawing number one. Get you some of that detail. There's okay, these. I, I can appreciate the two the two sets of dudes fucking. <laughs> Um, cause there's one on the other side. Oh yeah. Look at that. I didn't even notice that one. Side. So like, I recognize that blow job. <laughs> uh, definitely thank you, thank seen you. that before. Okay. Um, you want you, 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 you just a little more on that one? A $43 citation. You wouldn't be able to. I think to I, I, think I just that. lost this episode. I'm, I'm betting 500 now. <laughs> All right. 
I'm a, I'm a fan of that. I like that. Okay. Really All right. Here we go. And number two, <laughs> this one's so gross. This one, uh, <laughs> just in case you can't see uh, the the title or the word bubble says, let me put it in your prison pocket. <laughs> I like that it's pointing at Casey when you hold it like that. <laughs> yeah. I think he's got a little hang going here. If you want to, no, I, I see, I see the hang. I see the. It looks I like some moves. moves. Yep. Damn it. So uh, you got drawing number one. I gotta go with drawing number one. They got Damn the mustache. Dang. Damn. Yes. Nate yes. wins an artistic challenge to yes. be Casey. <laughs> hey, the, the underdog. He definitely got points for it being interactive when he held it and it pointed at you. <laughs> it, was, it was the two sets mustache. of dudes getting it on. I didn't even you know, notice the second set of dudes. I was impressed by that. When Greg when Greg spotted that over the goddamn internet camera, and I hadn't seen it with my own two eyes, I knew that's a guy that could spot a stick figure yes. blowjob. Yes. So with that, Nate, first time in the studio, is going to take down a victory 1,000 to 750. Yeah! Congratulations, Nate. Congratulations. And my one question is, does a stick figure blowjob count as hentai? <laughs> Greg, you seem like you have an answer to that question. Oh, no, 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 no. Greg. <laughs> I have thoughts. Yes, you have thoughts. I don't, but, uh, I, don't have, I don't have anything concrete, but I do wish to discuss your stick figure hentai after this. Okay. We'll talk uh, off air, as it were. <laughs> Greg, is there anything you'd like to add to the end of the show before we get out of here? Jeff, if Jesse uh, posts these uh, artistic challenges online, you too will recognize that blowjob. Thank you. I, I definitely will. <laughs> I definitely will post these artistic challenges as I try to post all of them. The last ones are just two giant dicks, so it's yeah. you know I, I'm staying on top of it. Win so win. To speak. One of them That's looks like she got said. cut off. Well, who knows? Who knows? With some knives and scissors. <laughs> Ouch. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. Thanks for staying late with me. Thank you, Greg, for uh, co-hosting. As always, appreciate you. Uh, you oh, guys yeah, uh, uh, want to throw anything out there before we jump yeah, off? Any social yeah, media? No, any actually, I, I, yes, I please really do. would yeah. like to um, throw a shout out to the um, Central Indiana <laughs> Multi Agency <laughs> Task Force. <laughs> Central Indiana for basically multi agency investigative team. basically doing fucking team. nothing <laughs> when fucking twenty two point five people died. <laughs> you guys could do your goddamn job to figure out one, one goddamn one murder. Was about <laughs> you let this guy play you that. for a forty three dollar citation <laughs> over the course of fucking months. Hey. Like, get but fucked. did they collect? <laughs> but did they collect a paycheck? Oh, they got paid. And did you die, bro? No. <laughs> then, then everybody wins here and thank you for listening to episode 33 of the Serial Chillers podcast sorry <laughs>for sticking in there with us through all of our girlish giggling. Uh, Larry Eiler was a man possessed and seemed to get away with just about everything that he did. And I think at some point, you know, these guys need to know early that, that something is, there's going to be repercussions for your actions or else we get a bunch of goddamn Larry Eilers running around. I don't really have much else to say other than what I did in the show, but you know, fuck Larry Eiler. Congratulations to Nate on his victory. I have to say that I was, a uh, very surprised. Casey is a very good artist and Greg uh, really used his ability to spot a stick figure blowjob to give Nate the victory today so congratulations to Nate on that and congratulations to Greg on that wonderful talent that he has. 
If you have any questions, uh, suggestions for future episodes, or questions or comments about this one, please reach out. You can do it in so many ways. Facebook is the Serial Chillers Podcast. The, there's also now a Facebook group. It's a closed group. It's just Serial Chillers Podcast. Uh, wait for acceptance. We'll get you in. It's very small. It's very new. But let's get in there. Let's be civil. Let's have some fun. Let's talk some true crime. Let's talk some not true crime. And let's let's be friends. Uh, Instagram is at Serial Chillers Podcast. The Twitter is at Chillers Podcast. The email address is Serial Chillers Podcast at gmail.com. You can call or text the show at 1 805 666 2513. Always remember, you can get merch at Serial Chillers Podcast.threadless.com. And for season two, I've really started to kind of try to focus on this to make it nice for the people that like to do the reading. But Serial Chillers Podcast.com is new and improved and updated weekly. So, lastly, it's just the Patreon. You guys have heard it 33 times and many more other than that, but you can give as little as $1 a month to the show. You can do it for as little as one month. Anything helps. It's all greatly appreciated. Thank you to everybody who has done that so far. I want to give a couple of, or just one shout out here. It's not a Patreon one, but I just wanted to give Alan a huge thanks if he's listening. I was really rad of you to stop me and let me know that you listened to the show. That uh, meant a lot to me, so appreciate it, Alan. And research for today's episode came from, as always, a Radford University timeline, Wikipedia, Murderpedia, and a Criminal Minds Wikia. The music in the intro is by co-host Greg, and the outro is by my brother Clay and his group Panic Club. It is called Aurora, and you can find him on soundcloud.com slash panicclvbxo. Thank you guys all again so much for listening, and remember, don't talk to strangers. <laughs>